there, there it is. Everything good? Filming? All that? All right. Well, welcome, you guys. This is the third of four membership classes. Uh, how have the others been? Somebody, I heard somebody at lunch say they had a lot of fun so far. That the bar is set pretty high, so I guess maybe I'll just start feeling nervous right now. <laughs> Uh, well, I, for one, am excited to be here. I think it's a little bit ironic that I have been given the topic that I've been given. I, I talked to some of you at lunch, and some of you already know my story, but I'm going to tell it again for the benefit of some of you that don't know it and whoever ends up watching this later. The topics we'll cover this afternoon are two of the purposes of new life, and those two are that we would be a place to be saved and that we would be a place to belong. And the reason that's ironic is tied up in my story. And I'll just start telling the story, and hopefully you guys will understand why I say that. Um, you know, I was born in this church to parents that were members of this church. I'm 34 now, and I'm probably the oldest adult child of members here. And my mom and my dad were here from the beginning. My dad was a pastor here for about 20 years. But my mom ended up not being a believer. So she divorced my dad when I was five years old. So I grew up nowhere near this place. I would visit once in a while, and I would visit from California. So I lived there from 8 to 23. And I grew up with a considerable amount of anger. I hated this place. So the idea that I was saved here, I got baptized. This baptismal didn't used to be on the ground. It used to be on the stage and it used to have this kind of rock around it. It used to be like wooden. Anyway, I was baptized right here eight years ago, and I belong here now. All I ever want is my family and myself to belong here now. But when I was like 10, 15, 25 even, you couldn't catch me dead here. I hated the people here. Hated my family, my mom and my dad. I hated this church and everybody in it. I hated God. Uh, it, was, it was absolutely incredible. And so... Anyway, I'll just tell you the rest of it. I remember being eight years old, and it was the night before my brothers and I would have gotten on a plane to go to California. And my dad is weeping because he knows that he has three sons that are leaving. His wife's not a Christian. He is seeing his life just fall apart right in front of him. And he's crying at the table, and I remember asking him, Dad, who created God? And he said, I don't know, son. When we get there, we'll have to ask him. And I remember that wasn't a satisfying answer and something in my heart shifted and the bitterness in me grew and it came out in a million little ways. I remember he flew to see me in California when I was 11 and, you know, he was saying, we'll go to the new Star Wars movie that just came out and we'll go get McDonald's. And we'll have a great time this weekend. And I remember being at the top of the stairs and cussing him out. I'm like, F you, I'm not going anywhere with you. I hate you, go away. I remember being 13 and my mom had a guest over and, and they were chatting in the living room and my mom could see me, but the guest couldn't. So I opened the liquor cabinet and I take out a bottle of, I'll never forget it, it's Bombay Sapphire Gin. For whatever reason, that just sticks in my mind. And I, I poured a bunch of it up right in front of her, smiled right in her face like, hi. Went back to my room and got drunk for the first time. And she was furious with me. I remember a couple weeks later, maybe months later, but right around that time, we were driving in the car and we had an argument. And I saw a police officer right over here and I gave him the finger. And he pulled us over and he sat me on the curb and he's trying to give me the, you know, the riot act. And I, I'm sitting here like, hmm. I didn't want it. I just, I didn't care what he had to say. And he wrote her a ticket and I'm like, ha, gotcha. I, I, was, I was about as big of a prodigal son as you could be. And people here were praying for me the whole time. Uh, it would have been a year later. I'm, I'm smoking pot in my bedroom, and I think hairspray will take care of the, the smell. And in my own arrogance, my mom busts in my door, and she's like, what are you doing? And she searches me, pats me down, doesn't find anything, leaves me alone, goes out. And it, I try to put my drugs in the crawl space of, of our house, you know, the attic crawl spaces in my bedroom. And as I'm putting it in there, she kicks the door in. And, and she's like, all right, I got you. Get in the car. And she drives me to the police station because she doesn't know what to do. My dad's not around. I don't have, I didn't grow up with my dad. There's no male figure in my life to discipline me. So she's like, all right, we'll see what the police can do for you. So they put me in the interrogation room and they are sweating me like crazy. They're, you know, the, the same scene you'd see in a movie, it's dark and the light is on me and 
people are pointing their fingers at me and we could put you in jail and all this stuff. They probably couldn't do a thing to me, but my mom was like, please scare him. He needs the fear of God in him like now. And so they did. And finally I'm breaking down. I'm crying. I'm like, I'll never do it again. And, and, uh, I was like, what do I need to do right now? And they're like, you need to reconcile with your mom. Do whatever your mom says. And so she grounded me for a couple weeks. And she said, as a punishment, you have to cut your hair. So she hands me clippers, and I have to shave off my green mohawk. <laughs> I, I wanted to find it. I had a yearbook, freshman yearbook of me in high school. I would have loved to have brought you that and, and shown you me as a 15-year-old. You wouldn't recognize me at all. But I had a green mohawk, and I had to shave it off. And I hated that idea. So I took these clippers and I didn't put a guard on it. So I just started going for it and I ended up with an inverted mohawk. And so I had to shave my whole head and I had more shame about having a bald head for two weeks or a month or whatever than I ever did about disappointing my mom. Didn't even register to me. And you know, that's just me as a teenager. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse. The older I get, I have run-ins with the law. Uh, I go deeper into Drug addiction, alcoholism, deeper into problems in all my relationships, deeper into anger. Um, It gets worse and worse for me. And maybe the most shame I've ever felt was a day when my dad, who was a pastor at the time, and Pastor Kurt knocked on my door in Madison, Wisconsin. And it's like a day off for all of us. I'd forgot they were coming. And so we're in my living room. Everybody's smoking cigarettes, drinking all these beers. There's beer cans all over my ground you know, getting high. And I had just nasty roommates. I had a heroin addict for a roommate, an alcoholic for a roommate, guy that had mental illness. We were a rowdy bunch. And they were just, the look on their face, they were shocked to see what we were doing. They're like, wow, this is my son. Or we've known you since you were little. And this is how your life's going. This is not good. And uh, it, it didn't feel good to see them that day. But eventually I did hit rock bottom and I can't exactly explain what that moment was. Maybe it was almost getting a DUI, almost going to jail, stuff like that. But a a day came where I can remember literally the moment I got saved. And yeah, that was a day. I was, I was in charge of a delivery business. I was the manager at this place that did deliveries through the night. So I essentially worked third shift and the boss lived in Minnesota. I was in Wisconsin. So if I wanted to get high at my desk, well, that was my prerogative. So I'm there, I'm sitting there smoking weed at my desk and I'm just cruising the internet, waiting for something to happen, waiting to get a phone call to get busy again and go about my business. And I read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. They will have eternal life. And I'm, I'm even tearing up thinking about it right now. Uh, but in that moment, I was changed. It was incredible. It probably took me a year to get sober. And that first year, I went to the Vine Church in in Madison, Wisconsin. I was showing up to Bible study half drunk, smelling like cigarettes, all kind of stuff. Stuff I regret, but I couldn't kick my habits. And I realized that if I really want this Christian life to be my new life, I need to make a serious change. And so I did. I treated moving to Cedar Rapids like going to rehab. And so I, I showed up here eight years ago, and I'm like, I need to get sober. And I did. But... I got saved in an extremely powerful way, and praise God for that. I think of what it says in 1 Timothy 1.16. You know, Paul is saying, I'm, I'm pretty much the chief of sinners, and God saved me as an example of his mercy. He's given me an example to everyone around me that God's good, God's merciful. If he can save Paul, if he can save me, he can save anybody. And so that's what we're going to talk about for as much time as we have Looks like uh, we have about 20 minutes to spend on this first purpose of being saved, and, and we'll spend half an hour or so on a second purpose of belonging. That's what I want to talk about is salvation. And, you know, some of us have a sin story like the one I described to you. Others don't. Some, some people have a drastically different story. They would say, well, I was raised in church. I was homeschooled. I never did anything I wasn't supposed to do. And, you know, I'm as innocent as you can be. I'm as innocent as a dove, and I'm saved as well. So what I want to talk about specifically is not just the act of getting saved, but about assurance of salvation. Because we're, we're rejoicing with God, with all of you, that we saw three people get baptized today. Marcus, Priscilla, uh, Christy, is that it? Was that you? You got a hoodie on now, but is that you? Congratulations. You know, that's an amazing thing that you've come to, to saving faith in Christ. Praise God. But I want to talk about what the next step is. There's this verse in Philippians chapter 2. I'll read it to you. It says in verse 12 and 13, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, 
for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So if I had to distill that down, what that means is God did something in you. Now it's your job to bring it out of you and to know what it is that's happening in your life, to have evidence of grace, to be able to see the fruit of what's coming out of you, look at it and assess it and say, yes, this is from God. That's called assurance of salvation. So it's part of sanctification, part of becoming more mature, more spiritual, more like Christ. You can look at your life and you'd say, yes, I have saving faith and I know it. Uh, Assurance is almost like being able to say, I know that I know I am a Christian. I believe that I believe in Jesus. So let's talk a little bit about what assurance is. And then I'd love to show you a couple passages in scripture that talk about this real evidence of grace. Assurance is a little bit different than faith. I've heard somebody say before that faith is like an acorn and assurance is like an oak tree. Now, let me ask you this. Is an oak tree too big to fit in an acorn? Can you fit an oak tree in an acorn? No, you can't. But is the germ of that oak tree, what it will become, is it in the acorn? Absolutely it is. And so that's what we desire for every single person here. You'd grow from saving faith into a massive fruit tree. I guess assurance is a little bit like a marriage. Uh, I'm going to go on a limb, but I say, Dave and Joni, you've been married here the longest. I know I'm right, but how many years has it been? 48. 48. So Joni, let me ask you a question. Did you have faith that Dave loved you before you got married? You've had 48 years of evidence. Now, are you assured that Dave loves you? He's proven it beyond anything. Right. That's what we're talking about. How does faith become mature? So let's talk about how faith and assurance are related in a different way. It's possible to have faith without assurance. It's possible to have assurance without faith. I'll talk about both those. But ideally, perfect world, we want you to have both. So what type of person would have faith without assurance? They may be a new believer, right? You say, I profess faith in Christ, but I don't have enough experience in my life to see the results of it. I don't have evidence yet in my hands that would tell me, okay, I know what my saving faith is. You may, you may be the type of person who's very inward and you may see the sin that's in you in crystal clarity, high definition. And you say, if this is here, there's no way I'm saved. And so you may scrutinize yourself at a higher level even than God would. That's possible. It's possible you may not understand some core doctrines of Christianity, right? We would say justification by faith. You're righteous before God based on your faith, not anything you do. So somebody keeps making these mistakes in their lives, keeps sinning, and they say, there's no way I'm a Christian if that's true. And uh, they may have a misunderstanding about that. There's somebody that may operate out of a sense of legalism and would say that I, I keep making the same mistake. I lack obedience. In fact, that's related to marriage. Let me ask you this. Would you have assurance after 48 years that Dave loved you if he was cheating on you? Yeah, you may you end up in a place of forgiveness and it could change and you could recover, reconcile. But the best you could say for a time, especially after a situation like that is, gee, I may not know right now, right? So that's like having faith without assurance. Well, the opposite can be true. You can have assurance without faith. There are people that go to church and they play church. They say, I I show up here and I, yeah, I know I'm a Christian. Well, why do you know that? It's not because Jesus is my Lord. It's something closer to, well, my dad's a pastor or my parents are missionaries or yeah, I read the Bible. Yeah, I show up at church. I do all the things. I have assurance, but I don't necessarily have saving faith. And then something maybe goes sideways in their life and they have some sort of trial. They have some sort of worldly concern that distracts them and they end up falling away. They had assurance, but that assurance wasn't based in real faith. So both those situations, faith without assurance and assurance without faith, we don't want that for any of you here. We want a true, authentic Christian life. That's what all of us here want for anyone who gets saved. 
at, at New Life Community Church, and, and I'm sure any church anywhere, God wants people to love him, to worship him in spirit and truth. So we want you to have faith and assurance. So we're going to talk about that this morning. What are these real signs of Christianity? Because they're really important, and we value them here really highly. So if you go and look at scripture, there's verses all over the place that talk about this subject. But there's probably four biblical authors, four type of passages that you could look at and point to and say, this is, these are good proof texts for assurance. So you could look at the apostle Paul. He says something about assurance. Jesus says something about assurance. Uh, Peter does and John does. We don't have time to do all four of those today. We're not even going to try, but we're going to talk about two of them. I want to tell you what Paul says and what Jesus says, even if we have to go quickly. So I'd like to start with Jesus. The words of Jesus are more important, but probably the words of Paul are going to be more relevant. So we'll start with Paul, we'll move into Jesus, and then probably we'll switch subjects. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up. You're free to look at it. There's a passage in Galatians chapter 5. It's verses 22 and 23. It talks about the fruit of the Spirit. You have God's Holy Spirit inside of you, and that is supposed to produce fruit. So the metaphor we used a minute ago about an acorn turning into an oak tree, maybe a fruit tree, there's, we're, we're going to take a look at what the fruit should look like. And I think a lot of people, this is one of those Awana verses. You, you memorize this from 10 years old, but it takes a long time for it to take root in your life. So what, is, what does Paul say those fruit of the Spirit are? He says that they are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So the first thing I want you to notice about that is some of those are emotions. Love, joy, peace, those are things that you feel inside of you. It's not always obvious that that's in you. That may not look like visible fruit in your life, but it is a solid test of your Christianity. How loving are you, especially in situations where you're tempted to not be loving or you're around people that are not loving? How joyful are you, especially during a trial? How much peace do you have when your life is falling apart? Those are signs of assurance of faith. So when the Bible speaks about love, there's a very specific kind of love it's talking about. Ancient Greek writers would have addressed four different kinds of love. The Bible largely speaks about one, and that's agape love love. What that means is, if you had to put it in layman's terms, I love someone and I know I love them because I can get nothing back from them. I love them with no strings attached. That's the type of love that God had for us. We had nothing to give God and yet he chose to love us. When we're able to replicate that in our own lives, that's a clear sign of salvation. I think it's worth noting before we go any farther as well that there's lots of evidence of salvation or grace that could operate in somebody's life, but not all of us will have all of them. It won't be really obvious. There may be somebody here that's really good at loving, somebody over here that's really good with forgiveness, somebody over here is very good at mourning over their own sin, and then each of those people may have specific temptations as well. They may be bad at some of these things. So it's not, it's not normal, it's not normative to have all these things operate in your life at a high level. I've heard an old Puritan writer say, if you have one, you have them all. What, you, what you're given in Christ is every spiritual blessing. Now, it may not be obvious you have all those, but it's like a string of pearls. If you can pull on one of them, eventually you'll find out they're all there. So love. What about joy? Your joy primarily is in God. Do you love God? And can you have joy no matter what your circumstances are? The difference between joy and happiness, happiness is what happens to you. Well, not, not, only, um, not only good things are going to happen to you in your life. Some bad times, some difficult times may come. Do you have joy in God, that God is your father who controls everything, no matter what the day brings? That's a sign of salvation. That's something God gave you that the world can't. What about peace? Peace is something that comes from God. God gave you peace in your relationship. He's saying because of Christ on the cross, Christ bore the wrath that I had for you. Now there is none left. So my relationship with you is peaceful. Well, that's something we can replicate in our relationships with others as well. And if we had to, we could probably talk about 
all the rest, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all the way down through self-control. But I'm going to largely skip that right now because we have about eight more minutes to interact on on this subject. And I want you to hear the words of Jesus because I think they're arguably more important. So if you take away one thing from this passage in Galatians 5 about the fruit of the spirit, it's that a test of your Christianity is not what you do. It's what you feel and it's what you believe. So if you have a heart that experiences love and joy and peace, that will naturally come outside of you into your relationships, into your life. If your heart is right, your world will be right. All right, let me find this passage. If you have a Bible and you'd like to open it, it's Matthew 5. We're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, probably about eight verses worth of it. Now, if you were here two, three years ago, you would have heard Pastor Kurt probably preach 60 plus sermons on three chapters of the Bible. This is probably the most famous uh, teaching or discourse in the whole New Testament, in the whole Bible. It's the words of Jesus. And he he says this refrain over and over, blessed are. And he gives a a quality, and then he gives a a blessing that is associated with that. So he's talking about the character traits that are found in authentic Christians. Now, if you had to read everything that was ever written as a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, you couldn't even digest it in one lifetime. People have been reading and writing about this for 2,000 years. But the, the mountaintops of commentary on this from people like Martin Luther, from people like John Calvin, St. Augustine, et cetera, et cetera. They would all say that these are things, these are qualities that only a spirit indwelled Christian is capable of producing. No one other than a Christian can truly do these things. They're important to understand. So I'm in Matthew five, verse three, and it says this, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, For theirs is the kingdom of God. That's something that as a Christian you should have. You should be poor in spirit. Now some people have taken this verse historically to say, well, that means that we need to have a vow of poverty or we need to help the poor and all that's very true. But what it means first and foremost, it's describing a spiritual poverty. There's something in you that is brokenhearted over your sin. That is something that, that is indispensable to your Christian life. You have to hate sin. It's not optional. So spiritual poverty, you have a contrite and humble heart. You are brokenhearted over sin. That is an indispensable condition of receiving the kingdom of God. Jesus says, yours is the kingdom of heaven. How do you know? You're brokenhearted. Charles Spurgeon, the the prince of preachers, one of the most famous preachers of all time, he said this about this verse, we rise in the kingdom by sinking in ourselves. All right, verse four, and we'll jump through these pretty quick. Maybe we won't even finish. In fact, let's finish two minutes early in case there's any questions. So what you'll get for the next couple minutes is a 30,000 foot tour of these eight verses. And then if anybody has any questions about assurance or new life and uh, what it means to be saved at new life, we'll do that. All right, verse four, blessed are those who mourn. The question I would ask when I read this verse is, can you repent? If you sin against someone else, can you repent? Can you, can you sit before them and mourn over your sin? If you want a great description of what this looks like, you can go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and Paul describes what true repentance looks like. And he says, you should not only be brokenhearted over your sin, you should have alarm. It should shock you how depraved your action just was, and that you're doing everything in your power to reconcile with somebody else. You're saying, my relationship with you is that important. I am mourning over my own sin. So it's easy to say that in the Christian life, it's all about joy. And that's true. We want to be joyful people, but it's not 100% about joy. We should be able to cry Christian tears as well. You see in the New Testament, Jesus wept. He wept over Lazarus. He wept over Jerusalem. He was sad when it was time to be sad. When it was based in truth, tears were holy. Right? Psalm 119, 136 says, My eyes shed streams of tears because men do not keep your law. Paul says it like this in Philippians 3. He says, I tell you with tears, there are many enemies of the cross of Christ. All right, blessed are the meek. So what does it mean to be meek? That's a Christian disposition. That's a Christian character trait. What it means is you have this uh, lowliness that's in you. You're humble. You're a humble person. 
Now, there's a lot to this idea of meekness, and I don't have time to get into all that. If I had to define it simply, it's not just being weak, it's being powerful, but that power is subjected to gentleness. You have a spirit of gentleness if you're meek. You have a spirit of humility. So another question to ask is, do you have a true view of yourself? Christian people should be able to see not only that you're a sinner, but that you're saved. You know, you're wretched. You're also a child of God. Who you are, your identity in Christ, it's both those things. It's somewhere in the middle. All right. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So I, we went to L.A. a few weeks ago. We heard John MacArthur preach. That man's been in ministry for 53 years. And he said one word that, uh, or one phrase that really captivated me. He said, at a certain point in my Christian walk, I could no longer distinguish between the word of God, love for the word of God, and love for the God of this word. He said, if you love God, you'll be hungering and thirsting for the book. You will love to read the Bible, to search the scriptures, to find righteousness in there. In the New Testament, there's really three designations for righteousness. There's three types of ways that we talk about it. It can be legal righteousness, and that is basically, another word for that is justification. The book of Romans is all about justification. The idea of that is that you are legally righteous before God. God's a judge and he pardons you. That's one way that righteousness is talked about. Another way is moral righteousness. How, how are you as a person? What is the quality of your character? Uh, and the third way is social righteousness or justice. That word is often translated as justice. So how are your relationships in the community and at large? Do you do righteousness? And that looks like justice. So... We're only in verse six. We've only done four of those, but I hope you have a taste for what an authentic Christian life is supposed to look like. Now, there's many that we didn't talk about. There's many that are worth talking about that we don't, excuse me, that we don't have time to talk about. But I basically blasted a complete fire hydrant of information right at you. Do any of you have any questions, any reactions, anything that you're thinking about as it relates to new life and it being a place to be saved? Anybody out there? Right. Okay, well, there's two things you could say. Uh, I know people like that, and the thing you should show them is Hebrews 10.25. It says, don't neglect to meet as a church. You're commanded to go to church. If you're a Christian, you're supposed to go, even if it's just a house church. At the same time, you know, a church, could, a church is a gathering of Christians. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. That's what Jesus says. So you could gather with a few people. But the bottom line is you can't do the Christian life all on your own. You need other people. You need the body of Christ to help you. Um, second thing I would say is you go look at John's letters. First John has this phrase that pops up over and over. It says, we know that we've passed from death to life. And then he fills in the blank about 10 times or something, maybe more, maybe less. But one of those is that you love the brethren. You love Christian people. You love God's word and all it commands you to do. And you want to do it. And so the person who says, well, Jesus is in my heart and I don't need to go to church. They would miss the larger scope of what those things are saying. That's what I would say. So if you get saved, that's supposed to look like something. It looks like you're in a Christian community. Can't do it otherwise. Yeah. Anybody else? I mean, we can, I know some of these other sessions have run long. So if you're curious about anything, this is a good place to ask it. And if you're not, we can start the next topic. You got another one? You can have, you could um, say so two. So what if you got like baptized and you got saved and you confessed that like, you know, Jesus is my Lord and King and all that stuff. And you're in high school or whatever and that happens. And then like you're on fire for Jesus, you're all hot. And then like maybe several months down the road, you like start going back into the world or you start doing what you were doing and that lasts up until you're in college. And then like, are you, are you still, still assured that like, yeah, I'm saved or are you like, no, I'm not saved. And, Right. All that. How long does it take for fruit to, you know? I would say that 
Some should be obvious to you fairly quickly. Because what, what is this process? You're taking the promises of God that are in scripture. You're reading your Bible and you're saying, all right, God is promising me this, this, this. And you're, you're kind of chewing on that. And then you're seeing it come to life in your life. Scripture should come alive in your life. And that should happen quickly, I think. Now, it takes time to develop, become more full, become richer, become more understood. You can improve upon your understanding of it all the time. But I think it was Martin Luther that said, we are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Something has to come with it. May take some less time, some more time, but it will show up. That's what I would say, whether you're in high school, whatever age you are. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about new life being a place to belong. I have some notes on that. I'm going to find them real quick. But this may be my favorite subject that we could talk about today. And um, I've heard a lot of people come here and say, this is a very loving church. And I hope that's not an arrogant statement, like, oh, pat on our back. We're doing so good. But I'm, honestly, the bar is set really high for relationships here. You know, in, in John, I think it's, let me make sure I'm right. Yeah, John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. There's a perfect relationship that occurs in the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are in perfect relationship. There's nothing broken there. There's nothing disharmonious, perfect unity among them. And, and that's a high standard to set, but that's our standard. That should be the standard for any church. Not that we achieve that all the time, but we try, we try for it. So belonging is a core value at New Life, and we take it seriously because the Bible takes it really seriously. We're supposed to have amazing relationships with the people around us. I think you can make the argument biblically that the most important thing in your Christian life are relationships. Your relationship with God, first and foremost, and then furthermore, your relationship with God's people. And then as a corollary, your relationship with everyone else. Are you just in your relationships? Do you treat people well, no matter who they are? So... Yeah, the Trinity is in perfect unity, and we're being invited into that. You know, starting now and eventually in heaven, we will be part of a perfect family. And so I said that this morning during communion, that the primary way that God wants to relate to us is as a father. And that trips up a lot of people. I mean, I didn't grow up with my dad. My dad was a good guy, but I didn't really know him until I was an adult. And so we have trouble connecting with the idea that God is our father because the way we look at God is through our earthly father. If you have a, a, an okay relationship with your dad, if you have a bad relationship with your dad, you might believe some lies about who God is. You're not gonna understand truly, no, he's a loving father. And so, yeah, we're not perfect in terms of belonging. We have things that happen in our relationships. You know, if we're doing it right, we're close enough to sin against each other. I hope you guys realize that. What you're risking in terms of coming into a very close relationship with people is having that relationship tested often. You know, and so we don't always get it right, but the standard is clear. So the fruit of that, I mean, let's talk about the basis of it in a minute. The basis of it is adoption. Talked about assurance for 30 minutes. We're going to talk about adoption for the next 30-ish minutes. And what does that mean? The idea there is that God's your father, Jesus Christ is your older brother, and that you are a co-heir with him. Go read Romans 8. That's what it says. You're co-heirs with Christ. So Christ is in heaven right now. And he was given a kingdom of the whole world. And he reigns at the right hand of the father. And we're being invited into that. He's saying, you're going to rule with him. And so we have an inheritance as sons and daughters of God. And anyway, that's the basis of it. But the fruit of it's amazing. And the fruit of it's all around you. There are people in this church that have been friends for 40 years. There's friendships here that haven't lasted that long yet. But I'm confident will. Because people are that close to each other. Um, our entire church, I mean, we go on vacation together as a group of 200 people once a year. If you haven't been to that, I'd highly suggest it. We go on vacation for four days straight as a church. That's how much we love each other. You know, there's, I imagine there's a, a church somewhere that maybe the people can't stand each other. Maybe they don't do anything outside of Sunday morning together. I'm not saying I know any places like that, but it's possible. And we're doing everything we can not to have that happen. We are one big family here. All the men in our church, we go on a fishing trip or a hiking trip once a year, a separate thing. All the men go on vacation together. There, there are people here that have been members for 30 years. I was talking about this with uh, Christian and Mamie at lunch. 
And we were talking about how um, there are people here that have adult children who didn't decide to go anywhere else. We're talking about American culture. It's, it's culturally uh, permissive, permissive here to grow up and move somewhere else. And then maybe your parents get old and you're supposed to come take care of them, but you don't do a lot of life in between together. You, your kids may end up in different cities around the country. But in a perfect world, they wouldn't. You know, if your children are saved, they're part of the family of God. And I know that people here have expressed, the, the parents, the grandparents now, have expressed incredible gratitude. All my kids are saved. All my kids are married. They all go to church here. I see all my grandkids all the time. Uh, that's, that's underrated. That's a massive blessing. Uh, what else? Yeah, there's a gang of about 40 kids here between the ages of four and nine. And they're all like best friends. Whatever, whatever happened with the, the older folks, the older generation, it's being replicated in this younger generation. And, you know, there's a lot of churches that have one good generation. There's a group of people that just keep getting older and their church dies. We've seen churches close their doors here in town because they didn't figure out how to replicate themselves. How does the next generation do what we're doing? And that's sad because at any point, if we're not investing in the people behind us, our children and our people that are, people that are younger than us, Every foundational truth, the entire pillar of truth as revealed by God in scripture could just vanish. You guys realize that? You have to invest in the next generation. You have to keep the family bonds really strong. So let's talk about the foundation of those things. So God relates to us as a father. Christ is our brother. We're brothers and sisters. It says here in 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, God says, be holy for I am holy and I'll be a father to you and you'll be my children. So if you read the book of Romans, you could say the theme is justification by faith. What I want to do in a minute is outline something called the ordo salutis. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. That's a Latin word. Basically means the order of salvation. Some people call it this golden chain of events that happen in your life. And I want to show you how adoption is better than all that. It's over all of that. So if you go read Romans 8, I'll read it to you right now says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And these whom he predestined, he also called, those whom he called, he justified, those whom he justified, he glorified. So God had a plan for you from the beginning of the world. You were predestined to get saved. And there was a moment in your life where you were called, you heard the word of the Lord, you accepted it, and you were justified. After your justification, which is you accepting the righteousness of Christ by faith, it says here you're conformed to God's image, you're sanctified. And beyond that, one day you will be glorified. What they're talking about is going to heaven. So there's this link, there's all these links in this chain of belonging to God. And over all that, is adoption. I want to show you why that's biblically true. I shared these verses this morning and it said that, where is it? It's verse four, Ephesians one, four, it says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption. So there's a purpose to that predestination and it's adoption. So here's the difference. Here's why it's more important than just saying, well, you've been justified. You've been let off the hook. God is a judge sitting on a, um, a bench, and he's saying to you, on what basis should I acquit you of your crimes? And all you can say is, well, because of Christ. And so he says, okay, not guilty. Now, if that were all the Christian life is, you wouldn't belong to anybody. All you, you would just, <laughs> it's incredible to me that more people don't understand it the way it's written right here, that you're not just not guilty. You're not just free from wrath. You've been made pure. And it's like God, as a judge, coming off of the bench, coming down and saying, you're not only not guilty, I'm wrapping my arms around you, I'm hugging you, and I'm taking you home. You are now my child. You've been taken from the lowest possible misery in life to the highest felicity. That's adoption. You can console yourself with the knowledge that your father, who is in control of everything, is in control of your life. He wants to give you all the blessings he has, and that includes belonging, right? We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. We can can operate like a family. So a little bit ago, I talked about four different kinds of love, that the Greeks would have talked about four different kinds of love. And I'm going to talk to you about those and uh, an observation I've had about that. So 
The Greeks would have had um, a concept of storge love, and that's the love between a mother and a child or a parent and a child. They have the concept of agape. We talked about that. Agape love is loving somebody regardless of what you can get back. It's a love that seeks the good of someone else. There's eros, that's erotic love or romantic love. And finally, there's this idea of Philadelphia. Now, one person I know in this room that's been to Philly is Pauline. That's right. You used to live in Philly? Everybody, something, a lot of people here did or a couple of you? Like six of you lived in Philadelphia? That's awesome. Philadelphia, the, the name in Greek means what? Brotherly love. Now, that, that concept, you can go read any old Greek writing, any ancient Near East writing, Middle Eastern writing, and the way they talk about Philadelphia is only in the family. I love my brother because we have the same mother, right? But if you go to the Bible, it talks about brotherly love, a love of the brethren, love of your brothers and sisters, and it's irrespective of whether you have the same mother because guess what? We all have the same father, And so that is the basis for us belonging to one another. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to talk to you about a section of scripture that has to do with adoption. And if we want to talk anything about what it means to belong here, if people have questions, we can do that at the end. If you have a Bible, you can go to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. And it's some understanding of what it means to be adopted and what it means to belong. Okay. First John three, one through three, it says, see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So if you belong to God, if you're his child, I read here in these verses four things that will change in your life, four things about your relationships that will change. And these are hallmarks for our relationships with each other. We belong to each other in several ways. First and foremost, your relationship to God changes, right? So you didn't enter this world as a natural son. The Bible says Jesus has one natural son. As, or I'm, yeah, the Bible says God has one natural son. That's Jesus, right? The rest of us are adopted because we used to be children of the devil. That's what scripture teaches, that we were children of wrath. We were consigned to wrath. God was ready to give us over and not bring us home. And when we got saved, it changed in that moment. So if you are a Christian, your relationship to God has fundamentally changed and that now God is not your accuser. God is not the one who brings wrath on you. He's the one who pronounces you not guilty because of Christ and brings you home. He's your father now. And so you belong to God. You have peace with him. You have forgiveness from him. So because of that, because you have peace with God, because you have forgiveness from God, that can show up in all your relationships now. What you do, you're supposed to act like the son. Well, what does the son do? He follows his dad. What does the daughter do? She follows her dad. Peace can exist in your relationships. Forgiveness can exist in your relationships. If you're humble, if you can reconcile with people, if you can have peace in your relationships, you will belong to each other like, like glue. You'll be stuck like glue. So if your relationship to God changes, you will change your relationships with people as well. Um, 1B, it says here in this first verse, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So we know Christ, the world does not, and so our relationships with people in the world, and by that we mean outside the church, people whose father is still the devil, that relationship is broken. It's irrevocably broken. You know, Jesus, there's, there's these statements all over scripture. You can't be my disciple unless you pick up your cross. You can't be my disciple, it says literally, unless you hate your own father and mother. And now there's some reason to believe that's hyperbole. Jesus doesn't literally mean hate. But he's saying your love for God is your father better look like hate. You better be ready, ready to give God everything. And your earthly family who doesn't know him yet, it's not that you ignore them. It's not that you actually hate them. But it means you have one father in heaven and one master. He directs your life now. 
So your relationship to the world, even the people in your own family just fundamentally changes. Um, it's incredible to me that Jesus said in scripture, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. And what he's talking about is how families split up over these things. I have people in my life that I am closer to that are not my blood family than my blood family. There's people on both sides of my family I haven't talked to for a long time because on my end, I've done everything I know how to do to reconcile, done everything I know how to do to be at peace with them. And yet it is not possible at this time for us to be together and have a relationship. I'm sure many of you have that as well. You have toxic people in your lives. You have people that are not mature, people that are not humble. Unfortunately, a relationship's not possible. And that's what it means when the, your relationship with people in the world has been broken. It's far different than people that you are in fellowship with in church. You can have an amazing relationship with them, even if you don't have the same parents. And it will feel more like family than not. You will have the same type of brotherly love for somebody who is your brother according to a spiritual nature than you would according to an earthly nature. If, um, if you've been adopted, that's something that can change in your life. It says here, your relationship to the future changes. Dear friends, we're now children of God. What, will be, we, what we will become has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we should see him as he is. So the idea here is that um, if you are a child of God, you have an inheritance that awaits you. That inheritance is in heaven, right? So you have a relationship that changes with the future. And that's an amazing idea. Your forever home is with God in heaven. You have an inheritance that's waiting for you. We have a joint inheritance we will receive together. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be left any money when, when my parents die. I'm probably not going to leave any money to my kids. But what I will leave is lots of love. That's what, I, that's what I hope my legacy is on earth. And I'm sure many of you, in your quiet moments, that's what you want too. You want to be really rich, not in money, but in relationships. That's what it means to belong to God, because you're going to have to sacrifice. Finally, your relationship to yourself changes, right? All who hope in him have this hope, and they purify themselves just as he is pure. So, the primary human response to God's revelation, do you know what it is? It's guilt. Most people read the Bible. If you're not saved, you're just going to feel guilty. You're just going to feel like you either hate God or you're uh, ready to run from him and just hide who he is, hide what he's shown the world, hide his revelation to you. You want nothing to do with him if you're not saved. Because inwardly, you have an inward voice that condemns you. So your relationship to yourself changes and honestly, in a beautiful way, because I know when I mess up, I feel my sin just destroying my, my in, inward uh, man all day long. My conscience accuses me, and yet I'm not ruined by it. Isn't that amazing? And all of us can say that. The people that have the hardest time in their relationships are the ones that are in their own heads all the time. You have, you have a lot of trouble relating to someone else. You're not in the moment and experiencing life with someone else when you're worried about what happened yesterday or what you said or what you did, you're still accusing yourself even as a Christian. And we have the opportunity for that to go away in large measure. We can, we can have Christ as an advocate. And what he says is, yes, my son and daughter, my son or daughter may have sinned. And yet I paid the price for that. They don't have to bear the consequence of that. They don't have to bring that into the world with them and ruin all their relationships. The, the sins of the fathers, the sins of your parents, they're gone in your life. If you, if you apply the cross of Christ to your family tree, your relationship to yourself is different, and your relationship with everyone else you go to church with can be different. Um, it's an amazing thing. You sense the presence of sin. It could ruin you, and yet now it doesn't. So those are some foundations for belonging. And uh, I see that as the primary way in which we belong to each other here as a church. It, the foundation of it is that we all together belong to God. So do me a favor real quick. Look to your left, look to your right, look at the people you're in the room with. The people you're in the room with are children of God. The person to your left, the person to your right, that's who Christ died for. If you can remember that, you'll have an amazing relationship with them. You'll belong to them, they'll belong to you. You'll continue as new members of New Life Community Church to make this place awesome. So, uh, according to our clock, we have about eight more minutes, and I would love to talk about anything, any questions you have, any experiences you've had at church, 
uh, how you interact with the idea of being saved, the idea of belonging. I want to hear from you guys. We've had a quiet crowd so far, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to stay up here for eight minutes, but I'm done talking. So I want to hear from you guys. Comments, questions, reactions, thoughts. Yeah, well, that's an important question. And to me, it's like, you know, 
it, it's the idea that if I'm before God one day and I have to give anything less than my best, if I, the report I give is, well, I gave you like 75%, right? I'm not going to be happy with that. I'm not okay with that. And um, It's all or nothing. That's, that's what God wants. He wants to give us everything, but he's asking for everything. And wrestling with that and realizing that how do I make the best of my life? I know I've heard Pastor Kurt teach on that for years, and he said that what God gives you in your life, the gifts you have, the circumstances you're born into, you have this hand you have to play in life, where you're, who your parents are, where you're born, what you've been given, how much money you have, all, the, all these things together, you've got to play that hand, that's God's gift to you. Well, what you do with it is your gift to God. And um, I would say that everything's become more meaningful to me. You know, like... Um, who said it? Jesus said it in response to Peter, and he said that he who has been forgiven much loves much. And so I've truly seen, like, I got off light. <laughs> I got off light. You know, Jonathan Edwards preached maybe the most famous sermon in America like 300 years ago, and he compares salvation to God having um, a spider's web, like one string of a spider's web with you on the other end of it, dangled over the pit of hell. And you're looking down, you're like, oh, I hope I don't drop down there. And instead, instead of letting you drop, he just passes you over to a safe place, which is at the foot of the cross. And so it's like, I've had that experience. I know what it means to dangle over the pit of hell. I just felt that. And so I'm like, man, I better make this count now. I can't, I can't do it halfway now. And so, yeah. Yeah, man, you have an incredible journey. Um, if you would tell someone who may have similar path like you, what would you tell them to make them reach to the point that you are? Well, ultimately, it's up to God. You know, I uh, th this church would teach Reformed theology, right? You don't choose your salvation; God does. And people have fought over that for two thousand years. But I, I'm not a I'm not a Calvinist. They call that by personal. Uh, study, I'm a Calvinist by personal experience. Like, I, I know that I was dragged to salvation by God. So in that sense, you know, I had nothing to do with it. Um, but what I would tell that person, whether or not it would have any effect, would, would be the hardest lesson I've ever had to learn, which is that I felt like I got dealt a bad hand as a kid. The, my cards were awful cards. I had four twos and a joker. That's how I felt. And so, um, what, what, I, what I ended up doing with that hand was saying, okay, I got dealt these cards, so that means that I'm a victim of my circumstances. Life did a number on me, so I'm a victim here. And, and out of that victimhood, what I, what I got to end up saying to myself and all the people in my life is that, well, I get to be angry at you, I get to have a bad reaction to you, I get to not forgive you, I'm entitled to do all these things because I was hurt. Well, eventually you grow up, and you, you're not a victim anymore. You become the perpetrator of sin. You're, you're the problem. And that's the realization I had to come to, is that my life was my fault, not my dad's fault, not my mom's fault. And I had to hit rock bottom. I had to keep telling myself, you know, that's what it is. If you're having a conversation with that person, and they're like, you know, whatever you're trying to tell them, whatever wisdom you're trying to offer them, they're not receiving it. The, the way you bridge that gap is to say, okay, but... How's it working out for you? If you're right, shouldn't your life look a little different th than that? You're not satisfied. And getting them to that place of understanding, like, you think you got it all figured out, but you don't. I mean, that's what we tell teenagers everywhere, right? But that's what you tell anybody that thinks they have it figured out. How's it working out for you? That's, that's what I would do. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's 1.30. Does anybody else have anything to say or add or question to ask? All right, well, let's, uh, let's pray together and we'll go home. How about that? Uh, our Father in heaven, we thank you that you watch over all this today and that you're pleased. We just thank you for all these people that want to be members of New Life Community Church, members of your kingdom and your family. And we thank you for every single person here. And we just pray that they would do everything in their power to honor you with their lives, that they would bless your name, that they would make you more famous every place they go, that they would be able to say that Jesus is Lord, and that from the heart they would say he's worthy of praise, he's worthy of honor and glory.
Let's pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Well, guys, I had an awesome time. Hope you did too. And uh, see you soon. Thank you, man. Adios. Thank you.